Hello, thank you for allowing me to talk today about some of the work that I've been doing at UW Medicine, conducting here um, at the intersection of transfusion medicine and clinical informatics. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Some um, commercial software is mentioned during, um, during this talk as their specific idiosyncrasies at this institution are relevant to this discussion. Um, the objectives are available here and online. So patient blood management is an evidence-based multidisciplinary approach to optimizing the care of patients who might need transfusion. Basically, this is with the intent of using transfusion as a therapeutic modality only when it's in the patient's best interest to do so and using um, best available evidence to guide transfusion. Blood utilization review is one big part of patient blood management. And this touches the entire process of, uh, of transfusion, including physician ordering, transfusion indications, thresholds, and monitoring for adverse events. Informatics plays a huge role in transfusion medicine as well, and in every aspect of blood bank. Therefore, the interplay of transfusion medicine and informatics for influencing blood utilization has many opportunities for benefits and pitfalls. I really racked my brain for a long time as to how best to structure this talk. After all, I've really been working on two parallel projects with some significant intersections. I decided that the best way to do this would be to first go over how transfusion medicine informatics works, then segue into one project where we have been developing a data warehouse to extract and combine data from various different um, databases within our institution. I will then circle back around to a project that we completed in parallel to update and streamline a lot of the transfusion related workflows in our electronic medical record. These efforts really come together when we start to talk about quality metrics um, from both of these projects. And these quality metrics will be a huge part of our patient blood management strategy at our institution. So Seattle's claim to fame was a centralized transfusion service known as the Puget Sound Blood Center, which was later rebranded as um, Bloodworks Northwest. In 2011, Harborview Medical Center first was the first to splinter off of this with their own hospital-based transfusion service. And then in 2016, UW Medicine followed suit with our own transfusion service. And in 2018, um, Seattle Children's opened its own hospital-based transfusion service. So our transfusion service is actually relatively new. It's about two to three years old at this time. Within laboratory medicine, I think that anyone would say that their lab is special. But our lab is really, really special, <laughs> although I might be a little biased. In most labs, a specimen is received, testing is performed, and the result is reported out. And this may or may not have clinical significance, depending on the type of testing that was, that was performed. The way that the blood bank is different is that we actually issue a biologically active product, much in the same way that a pharmacy does. Each of these products that goes out has a direct clinical impact. These are living cells that are characterized as biologic products and highly regulated by the Bio, um, Center for Biologics of the FDA and other accrediting agencies. And therefore, the Blood Establishment Computer System, or BECS, regulates the interaction between laboratory testing and product allocation. For example, if ABO testing of the sample does not match the compatibility rules of the product that's being issued, the software is designed to prevent this from occurring. So let's talk about some definitions here. An electronic med medical record contains notes and information that's collected by and for the clinicians in a clinic or hospital and mostly used by providers for treatment um, and diagnosis. The EMR at UW Medicine is a customized instance of Cerner that's known as ORCA, or Online Record of Clinical Activity. A laboratory information system is a software system that records, manages, and stores data for clinical laboratories. And at UW Medicine, this um, system is SunQuest. While a blood establishment computer software is a regulated software that's designed to be used for diagnosis um, and um, chosen to be used in diagnosis or in the prevention of disease by release of unsuitable blood. 
And this is 510K regulated. Most people think of this as an LIS or a blood bank LIS. But remember, the other part of it is that it regulates blood safety um, through um, prevention of, of release um, based on testing. I say this, but I might use LIS interchangeably with BEX um, out of habit. At UW Medicine, this system is currently a module of SunQuest. So a robust up-to-date tracking of transfusion met metrics in our LIS and our EMR are essential to accomplish appropriate blood utilization review. The metrics are also important for monitoring um, whether changes in blood administration policy um, has its in uh, intended effect. Up until recently, it's been no easy task to track all of the approximately 60,000 units that's transfused at UW Medicine and at Harborview. Um, in a way, we've kind of been operating blindly, um, even lacking some um, baseline data for benchmarking current operations. At the same time, we had been experiencing longstanding inefficiencies from legacy workflows um, that were carried over from prior to the TSL ex um, establishment in 2016. So here comes the first part. How does all of this stuff work? You might not realize it, but information technology and informatics is concerned with how information passes from one place to another. The clinical teams generally interact mostly with the lab through the um, EMR through orders. And the LIS um, is mainly interacted with by the TSL staff. So how does a message go from a provider and end up with the patient getting a unit of blood? For blood ordering, the provider first selects a power plan, which is a set of orders related to blood um, that may include guidelines, pre-medication orders, and related laboratory testing, along with blood product and transfusion orders. So what is a blood product order and what's a, what's a transfuse order and how do these all work and fit in with this? Well, the, produ the provider produces two orders, a, the product order, which goes to the transfusion service, the transfuse order, which goes to nursing. The transfuse order tells the nurse to do all the things necessary to get the patient ready to transfuse. They might have other tasks, they may have to um, give medications, they may have to do all sorts of other things. And originally this was printed because SunQuest, um, or LIS, was not interfaced with, um, with ORCA. And then once they're ready, they would let the transfusion service know that they were ready to, um, to actually give the blood product. So they would send a blood product release form, which is also a paper form, to, um, to, the, to the transfusion service. And then um, there's also the um, blood product order. So the product order tells the blood bank to do all the things necessary to prepare the product, including modifications to the product. If the unit has special properties, then the unit might be allocated to the, to the patient, but not necessarily issued until the, the team asks for it. And if there are no special uh, modifications or processing involved, then they might um, allocate at the time that the team asks for the unit so as not to tie up um, the inventory. The TSL staff does all of these things in SunQuest, and um, once the unit is allocated, it can be issued to nursing in order to be transfused. So you guys got all of that? Um, <laughs> there's gonna be a quiz on this later. You know I'm in charge of the, of the quiz. You think I'm joking. Um, so I don't mean for you to read all of this, all of this stuff that's on, on this slide. Why am I bringing this up? This is mostly to show that there's a very complex workflow that's involved with issuing blood. And also, you might see where some of the weaknesses could be in some of this um, workflow and why we need this to be as streamlined as possible in order to, um, to issue blood safely um, and with quality controls. One of the big prob problems stemmed from some of the manual processes which um, led to um, errors, which then um, become kind of a regulatory issue because, we're so, because we are so um, highly regulated. So this is the first branch, Act 1, which I call Database Development, How to Bin Trend and Influence SQL. So 
all of the interactions of the clinicians, the patients, the nurses, and lab staff, as Afer mentioned, are recorded by each of the different source systems in their respective databases. Your ability to get data from the EMR and LIS are affected by how these databases, beta database systems are set up. Traditionally, if you had a question that you wanted to answer about the data, you might query each of these different databases separately for each piece of in information, um, especially if you're interested in, in stuff that goes across different databases. Alternatively, one might hold the data in something that's called a data lake. That's a huge storage repository which basically holds um, a lot of this information in its raw form until it's needed. And if you wanted to ask a question, then you would query a subset of this data in order to process it for further analyses. The problem with this is that it could still be in its raw form in the, in the databases, and this data can be hard to work with. And to work with this data, each of the, each of the different users would have to um, do the processing themselves, and this, in, this would um, this would result in duplicated effort, and some of these efforts could be, um, could be singular to, to that working group. So it might not be, you might not be able to easily um, reference data across different working groups. So around the time that I joined um, and started working some of the, and started exploring some of the work that was being done at UW regarding um, blood utilization data, um, UW um, ITS Analytics was in the midst of developing an, an analytics data warehouse um, where the data from the source systems was extracted from the databases and housed under one roof. You might know this as Amalga, but it's recently been rebranded to the um, EDW or Enterprise Data Warehouse. Um, the data undergoes extraction, transformation, and loading, um, which is used to blend data from multiple sources. So during this process, data is taken from the source systems, extracted, converted into a format which can be analyzed or transformed, and then loaded into, into the database or stored. Um, a lot of the work of processing um, of processing is front-loaded with this kind of data architecture and allows for quicker, quicker analysis of the pre-processed data. So serendipitously, my contact in the data analytics department um, sitting up here is, was involved in both um, blood utilization queries as well as this effort to create this um, data warehouse. And at the time that I contacted him, I was able to help him in terms of providing clinical expertise and subject matter and as a subject matter expert. You see, one of the difficulties for data analysts um, who's operating without a clinical knowledge is kind of knowing what's important or not, um, knowing how to organize things in a way that makes clinical sense. On the other hand, it's difficult for a clinician without um, coding knowledge to explain how to best sort um, and organize this, this, this kind of data. So here, take a look at this fairly raw data from ORCA, which contains information that's from orders that's sent by clinicians. If you take a look at this long string of text, how would you split up um, and name the discrete parts of this data? Think about that. So raw data that, which comes like this is unprocessed, or what you would call non-discrete data. You might notice that there's some useful component parts in here, um, as well as some, some free text. Without any particular specialized knowledge, you could probably guess that there's a date and time here that's useful, that there is um, some, fo followed by something about the priorities here, followed by the dosing, and then a bunch of other stuff here, which could be um, various different attributes or could be various other um, important information here. So, it's more ideal to store this data discreetly at the lowest level of granularity um, of each of those component parts. And additionally, if this data is coded or taken from um, just a controlled vocabulary, then it can be a lot easier to process, to process this data. And converting this data from this long text string into discrete data is sometimes referred to as parsing or basically kind of breaking up that sentence into um, something that's more usable. I considered torturing you with a fairly long, um, long in-depth parsing problem, but suffice to say that there's a lot of coding involved. 
But think about this. If you were to search these strings for a pattern like two units, you'd come up sometimes with uh, other patterns that are interfering with that. If you're trying to look for a date in here, you could see that sometimes if there's free text here, some people might enter in dates. So how would you best approach this problem? Well, in order to, to fix this, we kind of split this up based upon commas into their various different fields, knowing that each of these different fields corresponded to something that was in, the, that, was in that order set. And then searched within each of those different columns or comma separated values in order to, in order to derive this, this kind of data. So once the data is robust, that's when you can start analyzing it. So what does this look like when we start blending data from the EMR and the LIS? Here we can, kind of, we can look at um, service data from Orca of where the transfusion went um, and how many units um, from SunQuest. And we can see here that Hemonk is one of our biggest users, as would be expected, followed by surgical services combined as a close second. If we say that we're interested in surgical services, we might, say, we might be interested in looking at how these procedures play a role in transfusion. One of the issues that we ran into was that there's hundreds of, or, or thousands of different procedures and procedure names. So after developing a parsing schema, we sorted all of the different procedures by how frequently they use um, any sort of blood product. And the ones on the top are the ones that you would expect. Liver transplants, cardiac procedures, um, lung transplants, etc. cetera. Um, we found that the procedures that most frequently use blood at UWMC and Harborview, which resulted at, in about 50 major categories of procedures with a, in about 13 different um, surgical um, specialty categories. And the mix of uh, important blood procedures at Harborview is different from UW. Obviously, we see a lot more trauma-related procedures such as, as um, incision and drainage, INDs, um, burn surgeries, ortho categories such as fracture and spinal fusion um, categories. So then, what percent of these frequent blood procedures or major blood procedures use blood products? And we can see here that um, cardiac, liver, um, and thoracic, like lung transplants, tend to use blood the most, the most frequently, frequently out, of, out, of, out of this. So between um, 15 to 22%, so one, one in six or one in four um, procedures will use some sort, form of transfusion during the procedure. We could look at this a little bit differently because frequency isn't the same as volume. Um, if we look at this another way, comparing the number of units that are transfused, this tells a slightly different story of how major um, ortho surgeries are in that when they do use blood, they seem to use um, quite, a, quite a bit of it. And the ones that um, Harborview v being the most um, frequent users of blood, being cardiac um, proce procedures using a lot of blood also is something that's not necessarily surprising. So we can start asking some more complex questions. If we're interested in anemia management, um, is there a difference in the hemoglobin prior to the, to the procedure when we stratify procedures based upon um, the number of RBCs that they received during a procedure? So this is c combining um, LIS results, BEX results, as well as ORCA data. Um, so we see here that looking only at cardiac procedures, um, that we do see overall, there seems to be a clear linear pattern between um, when people transfuse um, five or more units and, and a lower hemoglobin, right? And to a lesser extent, you can kind of see this pattern um, in, in, um, in when they transfuse one to three units over the course of an encounter. But you might ask, how can we enact patient blood management through this blood utilization um, review data? Well, one thing that we could do is we could look at service and, counter, um, data, service and encounter data and see if there's any difference in the number of units used in a case by each different um, surgeon or anesthesiologist and use this as kind of a report card. Um, this, so this shows the number 
of units used in a case by each surgeon and the percentage of time, times that they used that many, that many units. And um, of course, the names here are redacted to protect the names of the innocent. So let's circle back um, in Act 2, which I subtitle, Orca Orders Ordeals a Whale of an Overhaul. <laughs> this was mainly a massive undertaking. It affected many different um, services with many different nuances. But I'll mostly try to stick to some of the highlights here. I mentioned earlier that there are many legacy workflows that were problematic and that we wanted to update. Um, and some of them are kind of pointed out here in general. Some of the common themes from, from users were that the power plan was not user friendly, that it's overpopulated. There were too many words, the, word, the notes were too long. The orders weren't interface. There was lots of manual entry and many chances to make manual er errors as well as duplicated efforts that people thought could be just transmitted um, electronically um, without, without um, those kinds of errors. And there were separate product and transfuse orders. Sometimes people would forget to add those orders together. People wanted transparency for what was ordered. They wanted to know what was transfused the, and the status of the type and screen. They wanted more gu guidance for certain kinds of ordering. For example, ordering attributes people were always very confused about. And they thought that there was too many types of attributes and people didn't know when to, when to order them. So coincidentally, in November and December of last year, around the time that I joined, um, we, had some, we were informed that there were some resources that were set aside to update the ORCA orders um, as the ITS had some resources that were opened up from another project that, that, they, were, that they were working on. So an eight month project timeline was, um, was planned with um, planning, design, um, system build, testing, and training phases. The design team was, uh, was assembled, including um, ITS, LabMed IT and informatics, um, transfusion services at Harborview and at UW Medicine, SCCA, ICU, nursing, anesthesia, and others. And we had a decision escalation path um, during the design sessions with each of the design session participants, as well as a steering co committee and an executive sponsor. I'm gonna go into a handful of the changes that we enacted um, when we, when we um, started going into, go, going into this, but this is not necessarily all of the, all of the changes. So originally, this is the old, um, this is the old um, um, code sets as well as some of the values that are, that, are, that are in here. You can kind of see that there's a lot of redundancy. You can see like emergency, emergency AB is provided, emergency cross-match, emergency uncross-match, emergency O provided, et cetera, like outpatient, patient is waiting, outpatient patient is within two hours, um, plan transfusion, uh, you know, a bunch, a bunch of this stuff. So we wanted to basically take away a lot of the redundant values and take away some of the complexity with, with ordering. We, this is what the code set looks like, um, looks like towards the end of this. Um, we took the priority code sets down to about four um, unique values to, for about 71% decrease. Um, we took the attribute code sets down to about um, 14 unique values for about 48% decrease. And we took the um, number of units and transfuse orders down to 24 unique values with a 57% decrease. We provided another avenue for the clinician to communicate important information to the transfusion service through what we call a blood bank requirements order. Remember that the clinician mostly communicated to the blood bank through the um, information on their, on their ordering. So the blood bank requirements order notified the transfusion service of medically complicated um, patients and OR procedures. And we thought that it was very important that we put these categories forth in clinical terms rather than transfusion processing terms for better comprehension and usability. These were linked to, um, to special pr processing requirements, so it was a lot easier for the clinicians to understand um, 
what, to, what kind of information to give us. So this is some pop-ups that are occurring. So the blood bank's requirements field was, uh, is, a requirement, is a required field, especially if it wasn't previously documented. And so these relevant um, requirements would carry over from each encounter. And if the blood product attributes didn't match a clinical indication that was documented, a hard stop would return the practitioner to the power plant in order to modify their, the attributes. And this would prevent um, providers from overlooking attributes. So um, another thing was that this would then um, funnel into um, the, the power plans in terms of useful information at the, top of the, at the top of the power plans. Basically, this was a form of clinical decision support. Um, and as well, we also populated this, this area with um, um, information about their type and screen orders or if they had um, a cross match um, expiration that was coming up. And these attributes and special instructions went across different encounters. So another form of clinical decision support that we instituted was best practice alerts. So these best practice alerts for, were for providers if they were um, ordering blood products outside of clinically determined thresholds. And we instituted this for um, red blood cells in terms of hemoglobin and hematocrit, platelets in terms of platelet count, um, plasma in terms of INR and PT, as well as for cryo in terms of fibrinogens. And of course, this did require some um, kind of negotiations and compromise with the, or negotiations with the, with, with the clinical team in order to figure out which, which thresholds would be best. This is how long um, order sets were. You can see that there's many different products. There's a bunch of different um, um, lab values that are, that are associated with this. There's a bunch of um, different stuff that's, that's just a lot of clutter. And so we removed a bunch of um, defunct product types that people don't generally order, such as autologous, um, autologous transfusion or autologous blood products and directed um, blood products. And so this really simplified um, our list. A lot of the text in the guidelines was put into links so that they were still available for reference. And these were just generally streamlined for increased um, efficiency. A lot of the premedications and labs were removed from the um, normal adult um, ordering um, order set, but were still available for like um, BMT and other and services that actually use, use them. So in terms of a project overview, we updated, interfaced, um, we updated and interfaced ORCA blood product orders and transfusion power plans to, in order to reflect in-house um, practices and regulatory requirements. And this involved streamlining and standardizing order sets, streamlining power plans to reduce visual noise, as well as to institute clinical decision support and best practice alerts. We improve flow and communication um, between clinicians and laboratory systems. So um, blood bank requirement attributes com um, communicated context in order um, for lab st staff to understand what was going on. We improve workflows for nursing staff. I didn't really go into this too much, but um, the nurses each received a transfusion task for each blood product order to be transfused. It used to be lumped all together. Um, under one under one transfuse order, so they would have to ask multiple times for um, for providers to add more transfusion tasks for them um, if they trans if they didn't transfuse the entire order. Um, there was increased transparency of blood product status and a new transfusion reaction reporting form, which was a really big quality of life, um, um, which was a really big quality of life. Uh, improvement or enhancement for the, for the nursing staff. And then um, through this, we reduced the need for manual paper, um, paper blood product order forms with um, electronic requests in ORCA. We interfaced ORCA with behind the scenes, um, behind the scenes with lab systems where po possible. So the go live was completed in, on 814. There were about 19 technical updates that were made post go, go live where a combination of issues were resolved and, to, and um, 
some quick enhancements were, were delivered. There were about 20 issues that were called into the help desk, primarily um, involving training issues during the two weeks that, that, that we were kind of like monitoring this after the go live. And about 1,000 th um, different orders were, transfu were ordered during this time. In terms of the ITS um, statistics, they had about 18 people that was, that was working on this project in terms of coding. Their forecasted work was about 29,000 hours, but their actual work was about 5,000 um, hours with a variance of about 2,000, 2000 hours. And this was attributed to the complexity of the ORCA design and clinical workflows, including um, SCCA, which kind of came in at the last minute and um, complexity of custom, of custom code, as well as training requirements for two e-learnings and multiple job aids. So you might have received a thing for, for the e-learnings. Did everyone do that? I don't see a show of hands, anyway. <laughs> Single tier. Um, so product, so let's bring this back to um, transfusion metrics. Once this, product, once this um, project was completed, the work that we had done in um, pursuing patient blood management um, metrics became important for this project for monitoring and ordering, practi monitoring, ordering practices. This was easier to do because of the um, data warehouse design. Our ability to measure these metrics was dependent on the, our access to, the, to this data. And we see here that the number of transfused, of products that were transfused against the week that it was transfused. So against the number of products versus the week that it was transfused. And we didn't really see any appreciable change over, not, over time, um, at least overall, but we haven't really stratified these by service to look at these yet. We can compare this to the volume of orders that, of volume of order types that we received for product orders over, over time. Um, we see that as expected, certain orders which were phased out go down to, go down to zero and some of the other um, order sets or order types um, kind of pick up the slack here in terms of um, plant transfusion um, versus, versus what used to be um, plant procedures. And that was, this was meant to be merged into, merged into this um, form, of, form of order. We looked at order completion and cancellation rates um, as markers of clinician effort and workload and as a surrogate marker for the usability and intuitiveness of the system. We saw that there was an overall increase in completed orders and a decrease in discontinued orders, both by the system and by the user. One of the new features of our update that we wanted to know how often it fired because this was a concern that it would fire um, too often when we, were, when we were instituting this was the number of transfusion, transfusion alerts that was fired over time. We can see that the blood bank requirements order fires, fires quite often. Um, and this would be expected because it's linked to the reminders to the provider to order the proper attributes for each product. So of the clinical decision support alerts, um, hemoglobin um, alerts fire the most often over, over here, which isn't surprising given that um, red blood cells are some of the most frequently transfused product. Um, just for reference, um, about one hemoglobin alert fires for every three units of RBCs that were transfused during, during a period of time. Um, and one platelet alert fires for uh, um, for every approximately 10 um, platelets that are transfused, one INR alert fires for um, about 10 to 15 um, plasma that are transfused. So we're curious as to whether or not we really changed ordering practices. So we loop back to the average hemoglobins. So this is kind of like um, average hemoglobins per period of time where, where people um, transfused an RBC. And we kind of like looked at this as, a, as an aggregate. Um, we didn't really see any appreciable difference in, in terms of what hemoglobin um, people tend to transfuse at, um, at the different procedures with or without, um, at the different institutions with or without um, procedures performed during an encounter. So high hemoglobin values might be skewing this high. I would probably in the future um, look at these 
in terms of acuity of admission in order to look at these again or stratify these um, based upon service. So the only one that really seemed to have any, any sort of effect or detectable effect at this point was the INR prior to um, plasma transfusion. So here's the average INRs during um, that um, average INRs prior to transfusion per period of time, um, pre and post go live. And at least at Harborview and maybe at, at, um, maybe at, um, at UW Medicine, the average INR of transfusion seems to be slightly lower um, in encounters with no procedure done. Um, so the values for this are like, um, in case you can't read this, is 1.8 um, post go live and about 2.3 um, um, pre go live at, at Harborview um, during the year of 2018, and 2.3 post go live and maybe like 2.6 um, pre go live in in 2018. So we completed a major project to update and streamline transfusion-related workflows in our electronic medical record with hospital-wide involvement. We increased quality, um, safety, and ease of use. Ordering patterns may have changed slightly, but significant changes in blood utilization remain to be seen. And so we're still kind of monitoring this, and maybe we can slice and dice the data in a, in a, in a different way. But um, it's still that these quality metrics are still important for monitoring our current state and will continue to be important moving forward. What's some of the lessons that we, that we took away from this? And this actually wasn't a lesson, but I, I already knew this. But the hardest thing to change is, is culture. The laboratory has to be in such a process, very proactive in the entire process of planning, design, and testing. They have to, we have to build bridges and working relationships with, um, with clinical stakeholders. And we have to be willing to negotiate and compromise in order to make progress and, and move forward. We can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Another thing is that things that are out of scope don't always stay that way. Um, you know, especially if they're a core part of your, of, your, of your process, a lot of the time they tend to, those things tend to bleed back in. Even though people keep saying they're out of, they're out of scope, but they don't always stay that way. One important concept in, in, um, in any sort of development is, um, is regression. So this is, you could also think of this as whack-a-mole. You kind of like fix one thing and break another. And a lot of these, the time these are unknown unknowns. So you don't really know that like, you know, doing, doing one thing was gonna have, have an effect elsewhere. So what are we talking about when, we're, when, we're, when we start to think about challenges in the future? Clinical transformation, epic transition. This is what's on a lot of people's people's minds. It's, um, in December, you know, fourth to eleventh, and for about um, whatever, like fourteen days or less than that, less than fourteen days, they're supposed to do about three hundred or six hundred different design sessions, etc. So hopefully, this recent exercise will help will have helped to flesh out what some of the requirements and asks from the stakeholders are gonna be, what we and we hope that this will carry over into some of the design sessions. But it's not all doom and gloom, because um, hopefully some of the, um, since this is clinical transformation and all, we've been told, um, we've been told that all um, work uh, workflows are going to be under review, this could be, um, an opportunity to affect other not in scope work, workflows, such as, um, oh, I don't know, like the um, s fact that surgery orders everything manually and, and, and on paper. But who knows? I don't know. <laughs> um, the, the, the truth of the matter is that, there, that we don't really know how the, how the designers or the coders are going to, you know, um, put put all these sessions together, and and you know what's going to be the what's going to be the outcome of this, or how they're gonna how they're gonna actually approach this. Although um, certain people in the audience might be able to speak more on this. So um, what's what's in the future for database and metric um, and metrics? 
We want to continue to validate the data in the data warehouse. We want to develop tools for more complex queries as well as conduct um, statistical analysis. Um, and we want to do this in order to continue to provide quality improvement. We want to develop dashboards for patient blood management feedback um, to the different services. And we want to accept and triage research projects that are leveraging using this, this big data that's combining data from, from all of these various different sources. You know, we can look at vital signs. We can look at, um, you know, we can look at, the, at the various different procedures and um, a bunch of other data that's just floating out there. But I think the important thing is to know it, is knowing what question to ask, because otherwise we could go in all sorts of different directions with this. And maybe that's a good thing. So it, in conclusion, informatics plays an important role in every aspect of the clinical pathology laboratory, blood bank, and the transfusion medicine service. Being involved with informatics workflows allows clinical stakeholders to influence the quality of their data and metrics. We completed a major project to update and streamline um, transfusion-related workflows with hospital-wide involvement. And we have developed an electronic data warehouse to extract and combine um, data from our electronic medical record, laboratory information system, and other databases within our institution. Um, as a capping off point, I would like to give some acknowledgments to Monica Pagano and John Hess, as well as Patrick Mathias. I wouldn't be able to do any of this work without, without their support and help. Um, the work of Ray Bunnig and Joe Oates sitting, sitting here in the audience are, have been um, absolutely essential, as they're my contacts in um, data analytics, as well as to the rest of the, rest of the people who are involved, because this is, this is something that takes a really large team in order, to, in order to accomplish. And it's not something that, that you know, I did on myself, but I kind of did, but no, <laughs> just, um, but, but yeah. So, it, it, but really it's, it's something that, that required um, hospital-wide, um, that, that really did require hospital-wide involvement. So um, I'll take any questions at this time. So with Amalga or EDW or whatever it's called, can you look at outcomes after the changes that you put in place and, and ask that question, or is that is there is there not enough data in Amalga to ask that? So I think you, I think you can. I mean, it depends on what you're you're looking for. If you're looking for stuff that's in the actual notes, that's that can be a little bit more difficult because obviously that's like a wall of free text basically. But you can look at like hemoglobin values, stuff that's already in discrete. Um, that's already in discrete data. I mean, to, to a certain extent, you can also try to look for outcomes um, if, you, if you do enough parsing, right? You can like look in those notes and see if they, see if they and look for certain phrases. You can look for um, discharge outcomes. So I would say, yes, it depends on what the question is. So, um, so, so yes. I'm sure you got lots of anecdotal feedback on this, but I'm wondering if you're planning any kind of formal um, survey of folks ordering blood and finding out, you know, how successful you were from a user experience perspective. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. I think that that would be um, great to great to do in order to kind of follow up and and put a capstone um, capstone on this. Um, the where we got, I think we got most of the feedback was kind of just informal polling of of, of users who were kind of using this using the system um, after right after right after go live. But kind of a more formalized system of doing a survey would be a great idea. Monica, or Hello. Well, uh, that was a very good um, talk. Thank you. So I have two questions. Um, the number one is if you can expand a little bit more on how this data actually is going to apply to patient blood management and how that translates into clinical practice. Mm -hmm. And the second question that I have is, um, 
if you can comment also in other um, institutions' experience in terms of data extraction and, and creating this kind of reports. So I'll, ask, I'll answer the first question first. So the, that question was how to, how to use this in, in patient blood management. So right now, I've kind of mostly, or at least in this talk, I kind of mostly talked about the, how, how to get the data. And that was a big problem because we, prior to, prior to this, had a big issue with even, even just getting the data in the first place. And a lot of my efforts have been um, kind of a lot more on mechanics of, of, of getting, the, getting the data rather than the analytics part, which is what we are hoping to um, transition into once we get the data um, very val validated and that we can trust that the data is going to be um, is going to be robust, right? But after getting this after getting this data, um, one of the things that I talked about was giving feedback to the different services. So right now we have a bunch of different um, requests from OB/GYN, from surgery, from um, anesthesia for um, you know how much blood are we using, and we don't really even have like baseline data. So I think even just getting the baseline data in the first place is going to be very important. And then um, that way we can actually monitor because people are saying like, um, you know, we don't even know how much, how much we're using now. How are we going to know if when we do some sort of, when we do some sort of, um, um, you know, change in, in, blood, in blood utilization policy, um, you know, we don't like how, how are we going to monitor that? So this is going to play a big role, I think, in monitoring that. And there's some other options, um, for example, giving report cards um, to to like surgeons or anesthesiologists for how much how much blood they're using as compared to their their peers, um, which, you know, is something that has has been done before by um, by our own Patrick Mathias. Um, so I think that that it could play a big role in 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 that. Um, and then I forget your second question. It was it was other other institutions. So, um, and what was it about the other institutions? Sorry. Data collection and uh, yeah, this kind of people. So yeah, I think um, like stuff for for example like clinical decision support or um, places places for example like Stanford have been doing things where they have given report cards or feedback to to various to various different departments and you know a lot of and they report success with with um, with changing practice based based upon that um, you know I guess it's like your your mileage may vary I don't know how how that's how that's going to um, translate over to over to our own institution I mean here we we instituted something like clinical decision support and we haven't really seen too many big changes or fluxes in terms of our in terms of our blood utilization but maybe that's have, having to do with the granularity of of how we're how we're looking at things so um, so so yeah um, and a lot of the changes that we did institute have been um, based off of the models that we've that we've seen in a, in a lot of different in institutions, so I would have to say that probably every single institution is is different. And but following one of those models is something that we definitely should do. Okay. Yep. Hamilton, one of the. Uh, Things that I every time I go onto Orca and look back at somebody, it will tell me if the patient is dead, um, and and this gives us a in a sense an output. You know, this is, the system follows very carefully everybody who dies in the state of Washington and feeds them back in. These kinds of dichotomous outcomes would allow you to do logistic regression against you know large data sets and come up with odds ratios of you know what's happening. Um, how far are we from having these kinds of engines available? I think that that data is is probably already um, is probably already there, and that we can that we probably could look at these um, look at these outcomes. So I don't um, 
Yeah, I, I think that it, that it probably is 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 in there. But the problem is, if they die outside of the hospital, right? So this this that kind of data might not necessarily be. Um, I, I don't know if that's if that's all captured in there. Is it? Actually, it is through okay. uh, the Social Security Administration system, which sure. maintains that, and so they just keep constantly feeding the numbers, mm -hmm. the Social Security numbers of our patient log into the social security system yeah. and see who, who has died. Oh, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's, that would be um, a great idea to, to do. And as I said, we're, um, a lot of the work that we've been doing has been to kind of set, up, set, up, set, set this up and we are looking into, like now moving into um, looking at um, um, kind of research, uh, more more research kind of kind of things. But I think the important thing that we've been really working on is making sure that the data is very robust and that all of the things within the this data warehouse make sense before we kind of move move on to that. You know, as they say, garbage in, garbage out, right? So we want to make sure that all of the data is validated and that it all works. Yep. Anything else? Thank you.